She's the newest, biggest battle wagon on any ocean in the world, and she belongs to the USA. Her tonnage is secret. Her speed, armament, firepower, length, complement, and draft are secret. So is the ocean and the coast she patrols. And any enemy aircraft that spots her won't get back to its base with that secret, not against those guns. She spiked with weapons of nearly every caliber and range. And she moves in quiet and fast. First, the small guns open up. Then the bigger one. Then the biggest. Knocking out a target on the other side of the horizon. She's the hardest hitting weapon of them all in the long battle of sea power. And she's on our side. Maybe you'll see this baby one of these days. This ship or another one like her because a lot more are being built. Maybe you'll see her from the deck of a convoy or hear the thunder of her guns offshore. And if you see her, you'll feel proud. It sounds like an earthquake when she opens up with those salvos, but brother, that's no earthquake, that's security. Please, we gave our sons to our beloved America. Proudly we wait for news from them. How is my boy Joe? Is Nick all right? At last the letters come. But we cannot read English. There is much for us to say to our sons. We have good news of home. We want our sons to know. So they will not worry about us. But we cannot write. We are proud of our sons. But it is lonely not to know how they are. Mrs. Estelle Becker of the Civilian Volunteer Defense Office of the Bronx originated a plan for these fathers and mothers and New York's Board of Education, glad to help, furnished its facilities, releasing from Russian, Swedish, Italian, Jewish, and Polish, but now all American hearts, a torrent of tenderness and love to be captured in neatly typed letters and sent to soldier sons in North Africa, in Sicily, in England, in the Aleutians, in India, Australia, and the islands of the Pacific. There are a great many little ways to help win the war. Getting letters written for parents who cannot write English is one of the ways. Tell us what you want your sons in the armed force to know, and we will write your message on the typewriter and send it along. If you cannot express yourself in English, tell us in your own language. We will translate your words so the good news from home will reach your sons. I'm coming here. I know you're giving me good news for my son. They write me the letter. Well, what would you like me to write for you? Say, my son. We are all feeling good. We all miss him. Every day. His dog climb on his bed and fight for him. And we wait to your mother. This is only a small part of the war effort, but what a great deal it means to these mothers and fathers and to their sons. The kid's name is Barney Rosovsky, and his mother and his father came from Russia. He grew up in a Chicago ghetto on the wrong side of the tracks. The wrong side of the stockyards, where you have to fight your way down the street if you want to take a walk. He came up the hard way. He was one of the Golden Glove kids. 
In New York in the spring of 1934, he took on a fight with Jimmy McLarnon and carried off the world's welterweight championship. The first fighter in the world to hold both light and welterweight crowns. He was never a fighter who kept his titles in mothballs. Garcia, Patrol, Gennazzo, and Armstrong, he faced the best fighters of his time and held the crown for four years. The winner and still champion, Rock. He quit the ring in 1938, but in 1943, the Boxing Writers Association gave him the award for the man who did most for the sport that year. Comeback? Yeah, he made a comeback. But he wasn't in trunks and gloves. He was wearing the fatigues of a buck private in the U.S. Marines. His name is Barney Ross. Here he is. What's your job now? <laughs> Let's quit a while, Barney. I'm pooped. Okay, kid. Say, Barney, I want to tell you. Hey, jerk. Yeah? Sergeant Barney Ross to you, private. Yeah, sure. Say, uh, Barney, how did you make sergeant? Easy. First, you make corporal. Well, how do you do that? I've been bucking for six months and nothing happens. Really want to know? Yeah, sure. I guess there are a lot of ways of doing it, but I know just one. You take the boat to Guadalcanal and go in with the Marines. Hang around offshore while the Navy guns soften up the coast defenses. Then go over the side into the landing boats. in April. I was out in the jungle in September. That's pretty quick, but that's the way I wanted it. I had been rattling around ever since I quit boxing. I like to get around to where the show was, and this looked like the biggest show on earth. The road work on the island was nothing like the road work at Grossinger's, where I used to train. We used to get all baseball scores and fight returns over the radio, and we did a lot of betting. That was the only part of it that was anything like Jacob's Beach. There weren't any showers around. We went 15 days without washing and changing our socks, and any creek looked good. Of course, if you come from the west side in Chicago like I do, you know a lot about jungle fighting, infighting, cover and concealment, long before you see a jungle or a Jap. And coming from a neighborhood like that, and getting around the way I did, gives you plenty to fight for. Fighting in the ring is kid stuff compared to the fighting out there. Guadalcanal, it was a fight to the finish with no holes barred and no referee to break up the clinches. My company of Marines was spearheading the attack for a big army push over the Matanica River, about five miles northwest of Henderson Field. I spent one night out there I'll never forget. A lot of guys have been through the same thing. We got stuck in a mortar crater, five wounded leathernecks, two soldiers and myself. The Japs weren't many yards away. They set up machine guns before the army behind us could dig in. I lobbed over some grenades at them, and as all the other boys were wounded, I emptied my own rifle and also fired theirs. The Japs never stopped firing all night. That night was by all odds the toughest round I have ever slugged through. For 10 days, I had complete loss of memory from the pounding of the mortar. Anyhow, when I came to, they told me I was a corporal. I'm sure you shot 22 Japs that night, Barney. Yeah. How about that being recommended for the Silver Star? When do you get it? Well, I received it several days ago. But I accepted it only on behalf of my entire company. You know, this isn't a one man's war. Charlie, that's the guy I looked after till he joined the Army, comes home on furlough, see, and says to me, Jake, 
How about you joining up? Well, being a civilian dog ain't such great shakes anymore, so I am not averse to the suggestion. And the first thing I know, Charlie has taken me down to the induction station. Of course, there is this piece of fluff across the street. A little collie, built like a red fire hydrant. But I figure if Charlie can do without it, so can I. So long, Tessie. I'll miss you, honey. And there we are, down at the induction station. I meet the characters I'm to be living with from now on. Some of them are okay, some not too great, and some, well, a little mushy business right at the end. But anyhow, before you know it, you're shoved into the medics for your physical. Right away, I find out that this dog's army ain't gonna be no flea circus. They examine you, peeking into places you're surprised they care about. Everything from your choppers to certain parts where nobody but a dog should look. And no shots. Personally, I'll take the rabies. Uh-oh. Here's strictly a 4F character. And I understand he had flat paws besides. But you usually get through all right. And after you pass your gunshy test, it's over to supply for your equipment, which is consisting of a GI collar. You get your name on it and on your dog tags. And then they fit them together. Fasten it up. And brother, you're really in the army. Next, they ask you questions for classification. Me, they put down as a farm dog, which is what the army calls dogs who ain't exactly pedigree. Well, basic training is about the same as any soldier gets. They put you over the hurdles, and I ain't just chopping my gums. This stuff ain't easy, but I don't gripe because I figure back in civilian life, maybe I can save somebody and get my picture in the paper. Of course, it takes all kinds of dogs to make an army. Toodles here was a little, well, homesick. And although he don't look at here, Toodles later turns out terrific in combat and in Tunisia gets a bunch of ribbons up to here. The most fun of basic is the getting sore course. Charlie always used to give me hell when I got sore. But here, they like it. When a character comes along my trainer don't like, he yells attack. I obey at about 40 miles per hour. You're supposed to sink your ivories down to the bone. Boy, it's a pleasure. The eight weeks of basic whiz by, and suddenly you're crated up and off you go to advanced training but uh, not in a lower berth like Charlie, which goes to show this army ain't so democratic as it's cracked up to be. Out there, though, they give you private quarters, which ain't bad. All the time you're training till you make Rin Tin Tin look like a jerk who knows from nothing. You heal, and you stay, and you crawl, and you learn not to open your yap unless you got business to do with the old grinders and incisors. Being quiet so you can sneak up on the enemy is very important. So you practice signals. I learn about six. Now these GIs have only been at it a couple of weeks. Not bad, huh? Oh well, a lame brain. But a character like that don't stay around long. We're too important an outfit to goof off. When we gotta deliver a message, we deliver it. Uh, that's Blue Cheever of Sunnyvale there. Get the handle. Who used to win cups with his name on them. Comes from a very rich Boston family. After basic, we're especially trained for all sorts of work. Dog teams, rescue, sentry, patrol, which is our specialty, and damn near every job which don't require carrying a gun. According to the Army, one of us dogs is equal to a six-man patrol, which frankly don't surprise me in the least. Malta.
an island of white rock, eight miles wide and seven miles long, rising out of the blue Mediterranean. Malta is one of the smallest possessions of the British Empire, but the King of England came to Malta to honor its people. For us, the people of Malta, it was a great day. And the celebration of the end of an aerial siege that had lasted for more than two years. For many of the children, the sunlight and air in the streets were stranger than the dampness of the caves in which we had been living since early in the war. The routes of conquest and invasion never seemed to change. Standing between Tripoli and Sicily, Malta has always been of great strategic importance. The development of air warfare made it possible for Allied planes based on Malta to harass Axis supply lines to Libya and Egypt, and also strengthen the Allied hold on the Mediterranean from Alexandria to Gibraltar. In these films, seized from the Germans, the Luftwaffe at a Sicilian base is loading bombs for Malta. For two years, and through more than 2,000 air raids, we came to know these men well. The fall of Malta to the Axis would have made the Allied campaigns in Tunisia and Sicily insecure and hazardous. In the beginning, our defenses were weak. But as the days and nights of bombing went into weeks and months, our air and ground forces were strengthened until it seemed as though more Axis planes than bombs were falling. knew they would come. We didn't know the day and the hour until they came. We took shelter in rock caves dug by the Knights of St. John five centuries ago. children became more expert than many generals at identifying enemy aircraft. English flyers of the Royal Air Force and Americans from the Eagle Squadron made a sweepstakes of life and death. These men fought off as many as 17 attacks in 24 hours. American squadron leader Lynch of Alhambra, California, rode the winner. We saw our churches, our schools, our hospitals, and our homes blasted to ruins and pounded to rubble and pounded again into dust. All that was left of mortar our island. And then, as Tunisia and the Italian islands fell, there began to be hours and days when the skies were clear, when we could count our dead, and look at our homes, and take up our lives again. The King came to Malta to give its civilians, living and dead, the St. George Cross for bravery. Many of the people we loved were not with us that day in the sunny square in Valletta.